All right, I think we're recording now. Don't know what we call this, live and unscripted, live and tired, <laughs> what we'd call it. Uh, this is going to be the first and what's hopefully a series of, of uh, Mike and I just freestyling it, shooting the shit, seeing what happens. Uh, Mike and I have been meeting for oh, years now like this we just chat mm. and share ideas and and bounce sort of philosophical hypotheses off each other and so on and just share what we've learned through coaching and everything we figured why not record it and see if it can be helpful for people i mean we've got a lot of half-baked ideas this is where like this is kind of like the the drawing board for us where we just potter this around is the, kitchen. the kitchen yeah this is the kitchen where we cook it. this is the kitchen yeah or the sausage factory, depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah, it depends what comes out of it, I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, we figured, you know, that whole like open, transparent um, perspective of Brojo, we might as well show where it is that we come up with the shit that we talk about. And yeah, we'll just share it. And it's kind of, I guess it's a bit vulnerable for us because normally when we do content mm. and stuff, we get a chance to plan it out and, we put some polishing touches on it, but this, I have no idea what we're going to talk about, really. I do. Oh, you got some, you got some okay. ideas. I do, I do. Uh, often my ideas are either influenced by um, people I'm coaching or occasionally by my own life incidents uh, or by what I'm reading. And right now what I'm reading is really having an impact on me. I'm, I'm currently reading uh, the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Have you, have you read that yet? Yeah, yeah, I've read that. That's a good book. Very good book. I love this book. Uh, the experience for me, it reminds me a lot of uh, when I was a kid, first learned about atoms, and then realized that everything I could see in the world had this underlying kind of structure and principle and rules that kind of made sense. And that once you understood them, all kinds of new things were possible, like chemistry or whatever. And, and this book explains to me uh, a lot of the other psychological things that I'm studying, like, uh, oh man, just every, every single aspect of behavior I can think of, every challenge that, that, that anyone has relating to differences between the way they think they should feel and the way they do feel, or motivation, or self-destructive behavior. Uh, um, man, just, just everything is, is kind of explained by uh, this, this understanding of how the brain, of how the, the subconscious and the conscious or system one and system two, as Kahneman describes them, um, interrelate. What what were the key takeaways that you had from reading it? Well, I think, you know, we talked about this last week. We didn't realize until we, you know, we read it that Kahneman was like the founding father of cognitive biases, you know, the one to first give them names. And I love his backstory, him and that, Oh, who's his partner? W something. Um, how they used to just walk around just debating and pointing out the flaws and the thinking and the kind of the various biases and then giving them names. And he said, like most of his research was just conversation after conversation. And for me, the book was uh, just a reminder and a much in, more in-depth look of when I first went to university and I did a paper on critical thinking. And I just, I can clearly distinctly remember being in the first or second class, that paper going, why the fuck am I only learning about this now? This is huge. This is my whole life's been a lie and nobody fucking told me, you know, and, and it's kind of stuff like, I don't know, as soon as I was old enough to handle this material, they should have been teaching it to me. You know, people, I, <laughs> this has come up for me a lot over the last week or so people in suffering are often people who trust that what they're sort of seeing in their mind is some sort of reality, you know? And, and if they could just realize it's not, that it's, 
it's very much not. It's it's very very skewed, and, and if they understood what bias means and why every single fucking human brain skews reality to create these stories, um, you know, for, for me it was freedom. Like at first it was really, you know, especially when you think of like say something like the availability heuristic, where just because you remember something well, you think it's somehow more important and and stronger evidence than something else. I used to think like the time they had like some girl dumped me and, and it was really emotional. And I thought all girls are evil because of that. Like that kind of stretch of the evidence to create this like yep. fantastical story that has no basis in reality. I mean, how many people but, don't be daily suffering from that? You know? but, but it feels so real. That's mm-hmm. the amazing thing about it. And K- Kahneman made a great point. He said it was explaining uh, priming, which mm-hmm. blew me away actually. Priming is the, the it, it's essentially a bias, um, although I don't think it, it's, it's named as one. Um, it's essentially where things that you see a lot of just become normalized very quickly and then become the safer choice. So, for example, um, what was the name of the movie with the magicians? Now You See Me, Now You Don't? Mm-hmm. Have you seen this movie? It's a yeah. great movie. There's a point at which they uh, bring some a, a random audience member on stage, and uh, but he's not random. And then he needs to make some decisions: what color he's choosing, and so on. Turns out they've been priming him all day, walking by him with signs or T-shirts, or making certain he saw through his day the color blue in positive situations constantly. Just, just without him ever being aware of it. Then he gets on stage and he picks blue. And, and, and the principle here was that your brain has this measurement that it's always making decisions by that we're not even aware of, which is what's referred to as cognitive ease. If the decision feels easy, it feels more right, feels safer. There's no friction around this choice. So if I choose blue instead of any other, blue feels right. Why does blue feel right? Well. That that's where really priming comes in and, and makes a point and it affects every behavior we have. So one of the great experiments was called the Florida experiment or the Florida effect where they took some groups of students and they had them memorize some words and then they had them go to another classroom for a second test and the words in one example, they gave one group were words like um, tired, uh, injured, uh, slow, um, they were words relating to elderly people, mm. okay? And the other group just had a completely different group of words. And then what they did was they measured how long it took them to get down the hallway between the two classrooms. All right. And the group that was primed with the thoughts of being old took like twice as long or three times as long to get down the hallway without ever being aware of it. And then when the scientists showed them the results, they're like, that's not even possible. There's no way, I didn't even think of old people. They weren't aware of it, right? And there's no way that the thought of old people could subconsciously affect how fast I walked down the hallway. They couldn't believe it. And Kahneman's point was, the challenge that we have with these realizations is is first realizing that they're true, but but most importantly, realizing that they're true about us Mm. as Mm. individuals. Those are, I'm just as primable as everybody else. And, you know, you walk into a, a, a show put on by Darren Brown, you got to realize his mentalism tricks are all based on this stuff and that you're just as susceptible. The trick is you don't, you can't see it. You know, there's, there's an actual bias, but oh God, what's it called? Fuck. What's it called? It's, it's called like the bias bias. And, and it, it's where you you have a bias to think you're less likely to be biased than other people. And like everyone's got this one. And it's what makes you like the biggest sucker. It's it's what sales people thrive on. It's what magicians and hypnotists thrive on. If you think you can't be got, you're the easiest person to be got. This is what um prison ga- uh, inmates thrive on. I, I spoke to a lot of prison inmates about how they'd manipulate the guards. Like, it's amazing how much the uneducated criminal population understands about psychology. 
like beyond they can trick psychologists that that's how good they are at this stuff and they don't know what the names of all the stuff is they just know how to do it and um there's yeah there's a there's a great story called down in the duck where they talk about how to choose the duck the guy that they're going to get the guy who's going to be tricked into bringing drugs into prison and stuff and what they're looking for a lot of the time is the guy who think he can't be got you know that's a guy who's just so easy to move around because he won't allow himself to believe that he's being manipulated so when he sees signs that it's happening he'll ignore them which makes him even more susceptible and i actually i posted i was promoting um one of darren brown's shows like you guys if you want to understand psychology understand darren brown this guy knows how practical psychology works how people are manipulated he's so good at it and so many people watch his show and they think oh no the audience must be a plant you know this is just all camera tricks and blah 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 it's not real. Once you understand cognitive biases, once you read Thinking Fast and Slow, you understand, fuck, anyone could do that. If they understood these concepts, human beings are like a computer that can be programmed without it knowing it's being programmed. And, you know, that was the main thing we learned in, in corrections is you just have to humble yourself and know that not only can you be manipulated, you will be. No matter how advanced you think you are, no matter how smart, in fact, the smarter you think you are, the worse it is. It's really, really dumb people are hard to manipulate because they're suspicious all the time. Why do you want to do that? You know, they're really hard to get through to. But smart people who think they know themselves, they're a pizza cake for manipulators, you know. And it's all, you know, I think the biggest one, the one that stood out to me from that book was the experiment with the ice water. Where the, where the people put their hand in ice water and it's unbearable. Like this is ice water is what they use for all pain experiments because it doesn't kill you. you know? Put their hand in ice water. I think it was for like 15 minutes or 10 minutes. And they take it out and they rate out how painful it was. And then they did the experiment where you do that and you rate it like eight or nine out of 10 or whatever. And then you do it again. This time it lasts longer. But the last couple of minutes, they raise the temperature just a little bit. So the last couple of minutes are less painful by like a degree, like nothing. And then they ask people, which one do you want to repeat? And it's amazing how many people chose the longer one, which is actually suffering for longer because of the availability here is a recency bias where the last little bit was remembered as being slightly less painful. You know, and I remember he talked about how doctors are smart with this. That's why they give kids a lolly at the end of the doctor appointment. So their last memory of the doctor is a pleasure one. They don't remember all the injections and stuff, you know. Um, and it's amazing. Oh God, it's amazing how people do that. And they do that the other way around too. So someone could have a great relationship. It ends badly and then they hate the person they're in a relationship with. Like, dude, you loved her for like 10 years. She didn't change that much. You just had a bad ending. Like that's a fraction of a percentage of the whole relationship but that's all you remember you know and it's, yeah it's mind-blowing mind-blowing stuff yeah, it, it really is and and darren brown's I, I really love his stuff because it's one of the very few times you can see these principles demonstrated it's so hard to see inside these these psych labs you know i read thinking fast and slow just the the textual depictions of the experiments are pretty powerful but watching Darren Brown, Brown put them in practice is it's kind of mind blowing. I, I feel like this should be a required reading for most humans as well. Uh, yeah, this is like life textbook stuff. You know, we talk about that a lot, like all the stuff that's just horribly missing from school, um, from, from especially high school education, once you pass, you know, counting blocks and how volcanoes work. You know, the stuff that you, you just need, especially, you know, I've been watching a lot of Yuval Harari lately and his predictions for the future. You know, he's saying, look, the, the best skill you could be developing right now is adaptability because the only thing we know about the future is it's going to change quickly and you need to be able to move. And, you know, your job you thought was a career might suddenly become a machine's job and you need to be able to shift quickly with the new set of skills. And cognitive biases are your enemy. Not enemy, that's not the right word because we've all got them, but they are the challenge master them or you're doomed, you know, know them, understand them, know how to react to them or you're fucked. You know, <laughs> as the world gets more and more, uh, I guess you'd say fluid and flexible and less kind of ingrained. 
And, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are really going to struggle because they don't even know what a cognitive bias is. They haven't even, there's people I say cognitive bias and they're like, I uh, haven't heard those words before. I'm like, dude, that rules your life. That's the king of your life. And you don't even know its name. You know, like there's nothing that affects you more than it. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. It's exactly the same as people who don't know what oxygen air is, you know? Right. <laughs> It's like, dude, <laughs> gravity, oxygen, sunlight, you know, fundamentals of your world. Yeah, cognitive biases are one of them. Oh, it's just, it's, you know, we, we say a lot, coaching, I guess, is just somebody suffering hugely, and they don't realize that from an outside perspective, the situation is neutral. There's, there's no actually no actual evidence of threat or danger. Like we would happily go, yeah, I'll go through that situation. It's not a big one, but to the person, it's this huge deal and they don't understand why. In fact, quite often they'll beat themselves up because they can see that other perspective and they think, Oh, if somebody else doesn't suffer like me. So not only am I suffering, I'm a loser for suffering. And you know, they're going and it's just, they're just in this hell, just this hell inside their head. And it's because they, believe their brain is accurate somehow they believe that what they're thinking and that their perspective can be trusted and you know it's you know what it's the matrix that's what cognitive biases are they're the matrix they're the world you know that's been pulled over your eyes sort of thing it's i mean it's it's necessary cognitive biases oh yeah you know i i used to work with guys who had schizophrenia which is like all filters turned off. Everything gets the same like attention and importance. All stimuli is equal. And it's a nightmare. You're just drowning in stimuli. You don't know what's real from what's fake sort of thing. Cognitive biases reduce that noise, but they come at a cost and, and people need to understand that. You know, reading this book, it, it gave me a lot of, it shifted a lot of perspectives. One was I, I used to think of, uh, um, I used to think of the, the conscious mind versus the subconscious mind, kind of like an iceberg. You know, you've got this piece, you've got the piece that you're aware of that where your thoughts occur is the part above water. Most of it, seven, you know, seven times as much or so is, is under the water. And after reading the book, realizing that now that's not an accurate description because the, 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 the size of what you're aware of versus what you're not aware of in your own thinking, it's more like a, a dot on the surface of the earth. Like the comparison in size is so massively different. It's like walking into a cave, a giant cave, a, a torch, you've got a flashlight. The only thing you can see is what that torch is pointing at at any given moment, nothing else. And the realization that, that my whole world, everything I ever thought to be true about my world is defined by what I'm pointing that torch at at any moment but it represents such a tiny part of my, my world. Even my own thought in my own head, very eye-opening. You know, re realizing that my tendency to even believe that, that my current thoughts represent the, all of the truth, that I know everything I need to know in order to make the decisions that I want to make. Nah, you know nothing. You really know, you really know nothing. And when I compare the experience of, you know, at least to try to imagine the experience of what an animal's experience is like without a strong system two, system two is the, the thinking mind, what we would think of as the conscious mind with thoughts. Animals basically don't have that. Maybe, maybe elephants and dolphins to some degree, but most animals, they're just kind of more emotional. And yet, in a way, they operate so much more ha happily because they don't have they don't have the biases, they don't exist because they don't have cognition in the same way, and they don't have this they don't have the matrix, mm. this fantasy imagination of what's real and what's not. They're just that food, eat it, girl, chase her. You know, that's it. It's very simple, and we manage to overcomplicate things so horrifically. It's frightening. I don't think dogs would ever need a coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I, I, I watch dogs with just fascination because I'm like, that's what a brain is like without a mind, basically. That is just emotion, reaction. Like, 
my favorite thing to see is a dog being sneaky. There's just no planning, you know, there's just no awareness of how obvious they are. You know, they're just, they're just running on instinct the entire time. And I think as long as your external circumstances aren't horrific, it's pretty blissful to live that way. Of course, you don't even know it's blissful. You're just one emotion at a time, very little memory, you know, very, very little thoughts of the future. You know, you leave the house, the dog thinks you're gone forever. You know, it can't understand sort of time as a concept and it must be blissful. You know, the pessimism philosophy uh, is based on the, the founding idea that consciousness is a, a kind of a mutant mistake that as intelligence grew, this thing just popped out of consciousness and all it did was allow us to suffer. You know, um, That's the pessimism philosophy sort of in a nutshell. We became aware of our existence and there's nothing more horrific to be aware of, you know, because um, it makes you ask questions about meaning and things like that that just don't have really satisfying answers. But uh, I think of it more like every gift comes with a cost. And, and, and the gift of intelligence that we have as humans, the ability to make music and plan and have like relationships and all the stuff that other animals just are not capable of experiencing comes with this like side effect, you know, mm. all of that to work. We need to have mm. cognitive biases and all this horrific, uh, it really is suffering, you know? Um, and it's quite funny. You know, any f major philosophy you look at, Stoicism, Taoism, Buddhism, before it was a religion, they've got this idea of presence, like get back to reality, get back to the current moment, that's all that matters. You know, that theme is just strong through any sort of major philosophy. And what they're really talking about is get to the point where all your biases are kind of turned off. Get to the point where you're just with what's real. It's still, as you point out, just what the torch is pointed at. But at least nothing added to that. Not imagining what else might be in the shadows, just looking at what the torches point out, which is what an animal goes through. Like, it, like you said, chase the girl, eat the food, one thing at a time, straightforward. No, like, kind of, where's this going? Or wonder what this means. Just, I got to eat the food. I'm hungry. What the fuck? <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, that book. It's an interesting one because I wonder what would have happened had I read that as a teenager. Would it just gone over my head? Um, would I just have like rebelled against it? Because like when I first learned about cognitive biases, it hurt to learn about that. It was so, it's like humiliating. As, as every time they give an example and you're like, fuck, I've done that. And you're like, I've done that too. And you're like, oh, I'm just another fucking human. Like, I thought I was a special one, but I'm just as much as a sucker as anybody else, you know, like, oh God, it's so funny. Well, and, and I think for me, the main thing was realizing that I can't actually try my own brain. It's mm. perceptions, it's thoughts, it's decision-making processes, it's evaluations of good and bad. You have to suspect all of them and ask, why do I, why does that feel like the right path? Exactly. I think it's that question, you know, a lot of people, I think they spend a lot of time asking, like, we, we talk about this all the time. What do I believe in? What should I do? What is right? What is wrong? And they're just exploring what their beliefs are, not exploring why they have those beliefs. Mm. And once you open that door, that's when cognitive biases and this sort of two system thinking come into account. We're just like, where did I get this idea from? And you start to like, I, I think of it as breadcrumbs. You like, you imagine you're on a website and you start hitting the back button to see how you came to this website, you know, and, and it, it can be a scary journey. Like you get a guy who comes up like, Oh, I can't talk to a woman. You know, she'll think it's harassment. And I'll be like, okay, let's see where you got that from. And we just hit, start hitting the back button, going through pieces of evidence. And I go, well, that's recency bias there. And, there's the bandwagon fallacy because you watched, you know, too much feminism stuff. And, you know, there's the available heuristic because you saw one guy get rejected and you think it's a big deal. We start to start backtracking and we get to the end and we're just like, so you're saying you have no evidence for this. That's where this belief comes from. Fucking nowhere. Just one lie on top of another. Um, and, and I can see why people would be resistant to, to doing that. It's, it's much easier to figure out what you believe than it is to figure out why you have a belief. Because it's a, you know what it is? I think it's existentialism. Like, 
in the end, I got this from Socrates, I, I guess, or Plato. In the end, the only honest answer to a question is, I don't know. It's the only honest answer to any question. Anything else is at least a little bit of a fiction. You know, you're, you're starting to make stuff up as soon as you have more than I don't know, um, which we need to survive. I've got to get down to the supermarket. I'm not going to pretend I don't know where the supermarket is. Um, but like this, people don't like that. They don't like to say, I don't know. Have you noticed that? I don't like to say it. Um, I have to really hold myself to account. Like when I don't know something, like I caught myself, um, Christ, it was a few months ago. I don't know why, but my girlfriend asked me for advice on her period or I took it as her asking me for advice. She probably wasn't for just telling me something and I take it all as like a request for help. And I was like, I started talking and I just caught myself. I'm like, why am I talking about this? Of all the things I don't know about, menstruation's got to be right up there. Like no one is less qualified. And yet here I am yapping away. And that's because my brain's saying, yeah, you know, some stuff Yeah, you know that, you know, that put those two together. You get, you know, two plus two equals four. It just makes sense. In reality, I'm just talking shit, you know? And now I do that way more often than I admit to myself. And that's, that's cognitive biases. You know, that's, that's your brain making up stuff while convincing itself that it's the truth. It's mm. mind bending, you know, mm. in your opinion from coaching. Well, you know, that, that's, that's an, in- I wanted to ask you like in coaching, where do you, where do you see this come up? Like the most when you're coaching someone, you think, you know, they're, they're fucked because of their biases. Like what comes to mind? The first and biggest problem that I usually see is the perception that someone believes they have all the information they need to make a decision, to make a good decision, that they can see it all in their conscious mind, that that's all there is to understand. And they stop looking, they stop asking questions. And then they they change their question to what should I do now rather than the, you know, the essential task of asking, why do these things feel like the components of my decision? And is this decision even something I, sh- I should be making? So it's almost like they've got a workbench in front of them. They can only see what's on the workbench and whatever's on the workbench demands their attention. Which is, a, which is another bias. I don't, even, I don't even know what you'd call it, but, but it's, it's this idea that anytime I've got a problem in my head, it must be solved. It's an mm-hmm. important thing. The decision I have to make, you know, no, it's not, it's probably not at all, you know, and yet the conscious mind rules everything. Um, from the book, the biggest realization I'm, I'm coming to is that, you know, again, the, the comparison of a dog and, and a human is that people think that, that the challenges and the limitations that they see in their conscious mind are the thing that are making them unhappy. But a dog doesn't have those at all and perfectly happy most of the time. People rarely just can let go of what's in their mind and go, yeah, it's interesting, watch my mind do that crazy thing, worrying about this thing that's meaningless, you know? Um, so many good examples. A good, a good example actually might be um, some future predictions, even Harari stuff is as is, is good as it is. You know, we, we tend to get these ideas in our head and put them on our table and go, man, human race is fucked. <laughs> you know, what am I going to do about it? What's my part in it? What's the impact to me? How do I change things? Can we do anything? What's happening with global warming? What's happening with, you know, U.S. politics? And we worry. Some, some people just embrace all of this as problems that they can't move forward until they feel they've somehow dealt with these but most of them are completely outside of your control. Those that you can make some impact on, sure, you can, you can do things, but making that your entire world to the exclusion of all other happiness is not gonna help anybody. But we get in these, these fixated, these fixation states, you know, around what's, what's in our mind. And sometimes I, this is why I love looking at, looking at dogs as well, is that you're just happy. They just don't worry about these things. They understand that as long as their essentials are met and that they behave in a reasonable way, life's going to be pretty good. 
everything on top of that is just icing. But we, we completely lose that perspective on life. And the experience of life is, for a lot of people, is just full of anxiety and stress nonstop. You know, looking at, looking at uh, uh, Kahneman's work in this and realizing that, you know, how you, how you shape your world. Uh, a good example is, you know, most of the guys that come into Brojo come in with some degree of, of social anxiety but they don't have anybody in their world to dissuade them of that fact. So they think I'm alone, nobody likes me. They convince themselves of that, you know, recency bias. And then they're pretty sure that the world just doesn't like them and that they're just pretty screwed uh, overall. And then you get them into a group of guys who are like, no, we're like you, man. We, we, we felt lonely, you know, we want good friends. We've not really socially skilled. It's not something you're taught in school. You know, I, I've had some bullying experiences as a kid, so I'm a bit suspicious of people. You surround them with people like that, and within a few weeks, their world is transformed. And the only thing that's changed is that the environment around them is now feeding them, and their subconscious, evidence that they are acceptable to other people. That's it. This is the only change. And then the transformation from the subconscious from system one into system two is it's just amazing to see how their their thinking about themselves starts to change only because of this external circumstance that had nothing to do with the thoughts in their head you know there's a there's a kind of it's not really a funny joke but a joke about the fish in the water so the fish swimming along and his dad comes along and goes how's the water today and the young fish goes, what's water? You know, this idea has been living in something its whole life without being aware of it. And, mm. you know, it's interesting you brought up that actually the loneliness example. I had written a note. Um, I wanted to share this one with you because I had a, a session with a client today about loneliness. And it went somewhere different to where I've ever been. I've had loneliness sessions a lot, obviously. But what we found is there's this kind of, there's two beliefs that were causing the loneliness. He he essentially was, uh, he's got a big change coming up in his life. And one part of him believes that he has to handle that change well. Another part believes that he's not capable of handling it well alone. So the loneliness was kind of his brain saying, you need extra people involved here. You need permission, you need validation, you need support, you need guidance, you need resources. And we sort of figured that out. And the point of making the fish in the water thing is, you know, we talk about front door and back door problems. Person thinks their problem's the front door and really it's the back door. And so his front door problem is, I can't handle this. He thinks that's the problem that needs to be solved. It's either solved by getting someone to help him handle it or by, you know, changing his belief about trusting himself so he can handle it. He doesn't even realize that not handling it is an option. You know, that's, that's been, that's been sort of a, it's called begging the question as a bias. You're not even questioning that assumption. He's like, okay, it has to be handled one way or the other. And he doesn't realize, well, that's actually open for debate, but he's closed that mm. debate, which has put him in a position that's impossible because he's actually right not to trust himself. You can't trust a human being. You just can't. They're just too full of surprises, including yourself. So to say, I definitely will do well is always a lie. You can say, I might fuck it up. And that's the most accurate thing you can do to predict the future. I might fuck it up. Um, and he might do with some support, but the idea that he has to actually do well at this thing, where did he get that from? Why is that immediately assumed to be true? And I, we see this, I think, you and I, all the time. Like somebody goes like, oh my God, I got social anxiety. I don't know how to talk to people. Well, you're assuming you need to know how. You're assuming that this is actually a problem that has to be solved. And I'm not saying it's not but you haven't even questioned that assumption and look how much pain that assumption is causing you. And ironically, you and I both know that once somebody stops trying, it usually works out pretty well for them. You know, the, the human beings are kind of innately designed to communicate with each other. And if they stop trying so hard, it just kind of happens. They just live their lives. It just sort of naturally spontaneously comes up for most people. Um, it's the trying that makes it so fucking difficult. And the trying only comes from that, big question of I have to be good at this it's like, no you mm. don't actually <laughs> you've never explored what not being good at it as a lifestyle would look like sort of thing um, but that's 
I think that's what Kahneman talks about a lot. And that's that system one is you have no idea what system one's doing and it's doing a lot. It's doing a lot of the doing- work. You're, you're like at the receiving end of a massive supply chain and, and a lot's being done before that thing gets delivered to you consciously. It's amazing. And, and that's absolutely the, the key thing that uh, I'm taking away from the book uh, is that, you know, the, the thoughts that happen in our system mind, the rational thoughts that pass through our mind, even thoughts like suicide, thoughts like I'm not good enough, Thoughts like, I'm going to go approach this girl and it's going to go really badly and then the world's going to hate me, you know. Those are, those are thoughts. The problem isn't those thoughts. If we just look at those thoughts as, oh, man, there's, that's, that's an interesting thought that passed across my workbench, you know. I'm just going to touch that one. I'm just going to let it go. But we attach to them so intensely. That phenomenon, I think, is the root of the problem for almost everybody that I work with, is that attachment to their own thoughts. If they could just step away and, and see them as just <laughs> collections of electrical bits of energy passing through a specific part of their brain, that's it. And it's going to be gone in a few minutes. And they're not even going to know where it went. They'd be able to live life so much more freely. Because then those thoughts just become, well, that's interesting. Okay, I'm going to just ignore it. I don't need to do anything about it. They, they feel this sense of being impelled by whatever's, whatever's in their mind. And I'm not certain why that is. Like, if I look at that at from, a, from an evolutionary psychology perspective, I haven't yet figured out why it is that humans, unlike other animals, we get an idea of, man, I wonder if we can go to the moon. And then we have to find a way to try to go to the moon, for example. This is this, this sort of drivenness by our own thoughts. I think probably most philosophers are driven by that as well. Probably most conquerors, um, a few business people, quite a few sports stars, maybe artists. You know, there's a certain category of people, it's just like their thoughts own them. And they could not detach from them if their life depended on it. And it's, it's quite sad because when you're at the mercy of your own brain, you're staring at your workbench and you're missing everything else going on in the room, all the other possibilities and opportunities. You've kind of become a slave to your, your own system too. Um, and most people I see like that struggle. Well, I, I absolutely like relate to that because that was me like especially ambition that's the bit i relate to a lot like solving all problems that come across my path uh, to get somewhere i was never really quite sure where i just knew it was at the end of all my problems so any problem that comes near me squash that shit it's one maybe out of a billion that i have to solve but it's one less you know down and and I think what's really interesting, because what you're talking about is what acceptance and commitment therapy calls fusion. You fuse to your thoughts like metal being welded together. You become so attached to a thought that it becomes, it's like if I just focus on the microphone like this, the microphone becomes my whole world. My world is now a microphone. Now the world's actually still out here waiting for me to observe it. Um, but in my mind, I'm all microphone, you know, and people like that with their thoughts. And I remember like, like it, it's funny thing because we say thoughts, but a lot of time it's not even really like a very noticeable piece of language or something in the head. It's just an urge, a kind of push. It's really hard to describe. Like my desire to do well at work, I very rarely had the thought I must do well at work. I was just felt like there's a hand up my back, just, you know, mentally just pushing every time do something, do something well, do something well. It wasn't even talking anymore. Just... It's like, you know, when you, your parents know how to shut you up with just a look, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's just this presence in the room saying, do well, do well. I, I had a session with a client and, um, yeah, they, they were an artist and they were struggling to enjoy their art. And we looked into why, and it was this like perfectionism thing. They couldn't enjoy it because it was never good enough, even though, you know, art's ridiculous. I mean, who knows what the hell good enough is with art. And I questioned them about it and they were saying like, oh, well, I've got to do it to a certain standard. And you can sort of see the light come on a bit like, oh, I've never put it into words like that before. But that's what, I, that's what I feel, like a standard needs to be achieved and I'm never quite achieving it. And so I played the like 
Socratic naive inquirer. I'm like, well, what standard is that? Half an hour later, we still couldn't identify the standard. It could not be clarified. I'm like, you've been pursuing something your whole life and you don't even know what it is. You wouldn't know it if you got it. And that's why the person was like being really put off by their art because some part of them recognize no matter how well I do, this certain standard thing is a mirage. I'll never catch up to it. So I'll never feel good enough. And the idea that art has to be done to a standard, where did that belief come from? No, it doesn't. What happens if it doesn't? Does the sun explode? Do your fat fucking parents die? Nothing happens. You can totally suck at life and nothing happens. Why do you think you have to do this? You know what? One of the things I've seen, you know, I've talked about this before, is that the self-development industry actually has a lot of real unhelpful stuff going on in here. You and I have talked about law of attraction type thinking where you just fuse onto positive thoughts, which just makes you more attached to thoughts and gives you OCD. And then we've got like this kind of be your best self kind of messaging coming through and you're like, why do you have to be like, can't you just be yourself? Like, does it have to be the best bit? Why? What, what's, what's the point? You know, like why suffer? You know, dogs don't care about being the best dog they can be. They're just like, catch the ball. And they're quite happy with that. You know, one of the things that I think one of the biggest cognitive bias based belief I ever had in my whole life was this idea that I have to be special. I, I don't know how I put it into words, but I had to be significant, important, high achiever, I'd probably call myself. But this idea that like, I'm incredibly lucky to get this life and I have to kind of prove it. I have to earn it. And I have to stand out from the crowd and be this amazing thing. And you see this a lot in the self-help industry, you know, what is your purpose? What impact are you going to have on the world? Um, and nobody stops and goes, well, why can't I just like enjoy going fishing and hanging out with my mates? Like, can't that be enough? Why not? You know, who, who gives a fuck if that's what you do? You know, <laughs> like I, I always think like, um, you know, we remember the great, Emperor Marcus Aurelius or whatever we remember Achilles and all these great people. What about the ones 10,000 years before them? What were their names? Who the fuck knows, right? They were a big deal at the time. No one gives a fuck about them now. The idea that you have to be the special thing. I don't know. I, I might be going a bit off track here, but I think that's the thing that the cognitive bias has taught me is like, I've been going, I've got all these pushes in my brain, commands, suggestions, criticism sort of like things nipping at me to keep me on a certain path and i just obey like a little slave like okay i'll go do that then instead of going away whose voice is well, this, this this is the beautiful thing that that i realized where we get to take back control of our own brains is that we you you if we go back to the kitchen analogy you know the idea that you've got a kitchen it's got a bunch of ingredients it's got a hundred chefs they're cranking out stuff but all we see is the cookies that come out of the kitchen that's our thoughts right or maybe mm -hmm. it's a cake you know, it's a pasta dish we don't know what's going on in the kitchen that's behind a closed door called the subconscious but there's so much going on there but we can totally influence what's happening in the kitchen which means we then get to influence what comes out of the kitchen right what we're fixated on is the cookies and the pasta and the cake. And then we think, how do I change this? I, I've got, this is what I've got. I've got to deal with it. It's all I've got. You know, when we feel panicked at that limitation. But the number one thing that I've found that's really struck me is that what you feed into your mind through your senses, reading, watching movies, hanging out with friends, number one, your social circle, who you hang around with, changes everything about what's going on in the kitchen. It changes the ingredients that are getting fed into the kitchen. And you won't see it happen in one day, but, but pretty soon you start seeing the impact on what comes out of the kitchen. So, so I, I get so excited about this because it means we're, we're exactly on the right path with what we're doing at Brojo. Everything that we do is an effort to surround people with new ideas and new perspectives and new people that can give them a healthier, healthier your perspective on themselves. Number one, just being acceptance. You are acceptable with all your fucked up everything. Just the way you are, you're totally fine. We love you. Come on, let's go play some basketball. That alone is, is world changing for most people. 
And when you get that constantly, when you choose to put yourself in an environment like that, you know, that, which is a decision you get to make, then the impact that it's going to have on you is phenomenal. The impact it's going to have on your self-image, the impact it's going to have on what you see as possibility. Even we shared the same challenge growing up that we thought we had to have an impact on the world. But if I look back, if I trace that back, hit the back button on the browser, you know, I go back to school and think about, you know, every book I ever read about history talked about famous people. Mm. These were the people that mattered. Nobody else mattered. That had to have an impact on my thinking about myself. I could never, con in fact, I didn't even connect that until now. But I could never have connected that then. And now I, no, it's no surprise that I felt a need to be special, to stand out in some way, felt pressure by my own mind, like, well, what, what, what are you going to do that's significant, you know? And then that pressure. But then you look at people that live in a village life, and they just enjoy living in a village, like time to go put the mud in my hair and wash some clothes. Yay, another day is done. Zero anxiety about, you know, who's going to remember them a thousand years from now. None. They were never fed this, this crap. And, uh, and this, is, this is where I get excited is realizing that I don't need to fix the cookie. I don't need to fix the thoughts in my head. I can just ignore the cookie. I don't want the cookie, right? And just focus on the kitchen. What, what can I feed into the kitchen that someday, you know, is going to start turning out food that I actually want to eat on a daily basis and, and choosing my community, choosing my activities, choosing what I read choosing what I watch, you know, is, is, I wasn't even aware of it until I look now. So, you know, now I, I will watch YouTube videos about psychology and philosophy and science instead of comedy and entertainment stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I read books that are just fascinatingly fun about, you know, how, how the mind works. Um, think, think and grow rich, thinking fast and slow you know, uh, Yuval Harari's work, so many different things. And I surround myself with people that are actually good, poor, cool people that I enjoy spending time with that think like I do. They have the same values. And then I found that over the last few years, I've never experienced such this level of continual self happiness, content about my world. I wouldn't change a thing. All the, the, you know, when you grow up and you don't know how to, how to manage this, how to create a world that suits you, you know, you're constantly in this fluctuation, this feeling of I can't control anything, my world is crap, I'm always miserable, everything I do is never enough. But that's all shaped by the world around us, you know, school teachers and the friends that we have in our world at that time and sort of the chaotic life that we live. We think we're independent of that. We're absolutely not. We're absolutely 100% a product of what we surround ourselves with. And taking that control is, is just the most freeing thing I've, I've ever done. I'm just loving it. And I'm trying to figure out how do, you, how do you codify this in a way that, you know, you can give to other people just as powerfully. Yeah, that's always the tricky bit. Like, I've had this conversation a lot and, and in the sense, like, trying to explain to someone that the only source of pain is their own mind and they actually do have a huge influence on that. And it's not like, I don't mean like positive thinking, like you can just pretend to yourself that things are cool. It's that you told yourself that they weren't cool in the first place. You, you made that up. Like a, a greatest one for me that I've experienced like relief from over the last year is financial worries. I used to like, if, if I looked at my bank account, it was lower than I expected. I'd get this kind of, you know, this hot, tense feeling and it's kind of better go find some money. And I just started doing this practice. Whenever that feeling came over me, I just stop and go, okay, where is the evidence that I need cash in my hand right now? You know, is there anybody holding a gun to my head, say cash or your family dies? Like, uh, am I going to be sleeping outside in the snow tonight? Like, where's the evidence? And I'm yet to have an experience when that question was answered with, yeah, you do. You know, it, I've never needed it. Never. <laughs> I've often felt like I did. But that feeling was based on a lie that I told myself after seeing numbers. Like, 
one of the things I talk about with financial insecurity is somebody, if they emptied your bank account and you didn't know, it wouldn't affect you at all. And, you know, until your card declined or whatever. And up until the point where your card declined, you're untouched, even though your bank account's now empty. Now, if I was to tell you that your bank account's empty and I'm lying, you'd be gutted. You know, you'll have a full on like pain reaction. You'll die a million deaths before you actually die sort of thing. Um, and nothing bad actually happened. And in both of those situations, whether it's true or not that your bank account's empty, nothing bad happened to you. There's a story that something bad happened to you and that hurts. And you're the one who told yourself that story, you know, and that's what I think. I think the starting point, you know, that sort of back browser idea, that starting point, like if I'm in pain right now, somehow I've done this to myself. That's my starting point. My job is to figure out either how I did it to myself and I can't figure out that what's a helpful reaction to it. You know, cause what, what's great about it is, I mean, cognitive bias is a, a sort of running joke in psychology is that psychology is the brain telling us about itself. You know, like who knows if it's making shit up or not. It could just be like selling us a story because it's the brain that came up with psychology in the first place. Um, and so even if your brain goes, oh, you have... <laughs> even it's if your a brain, little scary. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like we're, we're kind of slaves to our own brains. It's, it's shattering to think about it, but... Yeah, what was it like? Yeah, you know, that was a neuroscience is the brain studying itself and telling itself what it is. It's, it's this bizarre thing. Um, <laughs> it hurts to think about. But this idea, like, even if your brain goes, well, maybe it's because your mum abused you when you were younger or you were bullied or because that girl didn't like you at work. Your brain's just making that up. You don't know if that's true. Your brain might deliberately be lying to you and you can't even see that deliberate pattern of thinking. It might have a kind of a plan. Like, quite often I notice. I call it like fear deception fear like paints this picture in my head of what could happen. And it's a very convincing picture. It's a very influential picture and it looks just a hundred percent true. And then if I stop and go, well, where's the proof for it? The picture just falls apart. I was like, wait, that's not true at all. That's, that's as true as Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. It's a completely fictionalized story. It looks really good. It's this HD fucking movie in my head. But if I look around the real world, if I open my actual eyes and go, okay, where is this happening? It's nowhere. And, and like I was, I think Jim Carrey was talking about it. Like, what does he say? There's a big difference between a dog that's going to eat you in your mind and an actual dog that's going to eat you. And because people don't know that difference, they just spend their whole life in like fight or flight response, you know? And, and yeah, I, I don't know. We're going all over the place with this, but it's just this idea. Like if people just stop trusting their mind so much as being a source of like truth and see it more as like, I like the kitchen idea. It's just ingredients spread all over the bench. It's tools. Some of them you could use. Some of them are appropriate. Some of them don't go together very well. Some of them shouldn't be there at all, but they are. And you can't stop that because that's the curse of consciousness, you know. But you don't actually have to cook with any of them. You don't even have to be in the fucking kitchen. You know, like that, um, God, what's that movie? Forgetting Sarah Marshall is that surfer dude. And he's like, you know, when life gives you lemons, I just say, fuck the lemons and fail. You know, I love that. It's kind of like, oh, there's that other option where you just, you can just be like, fuck this. I'm not saying people should just bail on their life, but this idea that you, you have to follow those compulsions and those kind of urgents, urgents, uh, those urges in your head, like those, the commands, like someone's telling you what to do. It's like, nah, it's just noise. You know, you don't buy everything from every advertisement that you hear. You don't have to buy every thought either. Well, you know, the, 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 kitchen, the kitchen analogy is really significant for me because, you know, the, the first realization is if we control the ingredients going into it, we, we change everything. We mm -hmm. change what can be made, right? That's like stopping the hugely... good shit, yeah. That's right. That, that's hugely, hugely significant. But there's a second part, too, which is that those ingredients can be turned into a million different things. Who decided that they became cookies? Because we don't make that decision consciously, right? That part I really want to understand is 
the part of interpretation, you know, is, is how, how do, how does this subconscious thought, the system one stuff become thought? What filters did it go through? Who's that executive, you know, making those decisions? And uh, if I, if I could understand that, then it doesn't matter even what's in the kitchen. You can make some pretty good stuff out of most things if you're creative. You know, that's quite fascinating. I'll tell you what, what this lesson has taught me, though, is to be really worried about people that are isolated. Mm. People that are isolated. Because here's the thing. As humans, you know, our brain is, was evolved this way. That's actually okay as long as we're social. Our brain's, you know, tendencies to do these <laughs> fucked up things is totally fine in a social environment because because we end up, the, the workbench is bigger. Mm. We end up sharing each other's meals. Maybe I made cookies, but this guy made some healthy food. So we share. I give him some dessert, he gives me something, you know, now we're both good, right? But, but the way society's gone, the isolation that we experience now is really significant. And I don't think people realize that when you limit your workbench to just your workbench, um, you're absolutely at the mercy of your own brain of what's going on. You've got nothing else to consider. You're in this tiny little matrix, a one room matrix. And as far as you're aware, there's nothing outside that door. There isn't even a door. There isn't even a door, you know, that's it. You're in your own prison. And I think that's the experience. And some of the guys that, that we interact with when they first, we were first able to make contact with them at Brojo. And then we hear that they've been lurking for the past two years, but they were too anxious to come to their first meetup. And I'm like, man, two years of suffering and why? It was, it was that isolation. Oh, absolutely. And well, it goes the other way too. You know, the bandwagon fallacy when everyone around you thinks the same, when they're all cooking with the same ingredients, they can go both ways. And, um, you know, we saw that when we reviewed like the red pill and MGTOW, we looked at some of these things where everybody thinks that women are evil sort of thing. And we're just like, wow, that is, that's even worse than being alone because now you think it's confirmed. You know, that's one of the major biases is, 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 you know, I can't remember what it's called, but if someone agrees with you, you think it must be more true, you know? And that's one of the ones I always watch out for. I'm like, well, everybody thought the earth was flat at one stage. So let's not just lose sight of the fact that we can all be wrong at once, you know? Um, but absolutely, I think if I had to choose between isolation and being surrounded by peers in terms of what's likely to be most healthy, it is probably mm. surrounded by peers. But more importantly, rich mixture, different workbenches, people have got different ingredients in their kitchen. And, you know, I'm actually, it's so funny we're using this analogy because I've just been binging hard on MasterChef lately. I don't know why I used to hate cooking programs. Um, but it's interesting because of the psychology, like watching people who are great cooks just fall to pieces because of the stress and the pressure of like a time limit, watch them make like simple mistakes that they wouldn't make if they were enjoying themselves, watching the guys who enjoy themselves do so much better, watching also the people who like, they get a weird ingredient that they've never cooked with before and they just fall to pieces where somebody else goes, Oh, what's this like? What am I familiar with? How can I relate to it? I mean, it's just so sim similar to what we've just been talking about. The people with the flexible mind who have a big range of experience have been influenced by a lot of different things. They're just so much more adaptable. They're sort of like they're used to kind of mixing it up. They, every meal they make is something they've never made before, but they've got the principles down. And I think of like, and there was literally different cultures uh, on the show. You know, there was the guy who's strong, the Indian, the guy who who only does desserts. There was these kind of cultures of cooking amongst each person and they influenced each other. And you saw like the Indian guy does an awesome dessert because he's been hanging out with the dessert guy who's now doing an awesome curry. And you're kind of like, oh, watch that sort of just spread across. And, you know, for me, nothing blew my mind more than traveling overseas. My, my first big trip was actually to the United States. And it just threw me for a loop that these people would be so different. You know, I was like, I'm just going to be meeting New Zealanders with an accent. I was like, no, I'm on a different planet. These people think so differently to me. Everything I believe in, they believe some other thing. And then I went to Thailand. And I'm like, oh, I've got to scrub the plate clean again because this is another different way of thinking. And now I'm like in Eastern Europe. I'm like, oh, again with the new shit. And I've just come to realize like, 
this is why I'm always kind of suspicious of people who never left their hometown or, or people who are isolated. It was like, dude, you, you're like, you've only had a glimpse at possible realities, you know, and you're just in your own little island world that, you know, what you said, the room that you don't even think there's a door to, you don't even realize it's a room. You think it's everything. And like, you barely even started. Once you open the door, you're, it's going to hurt your brain. How different other people see the world and, but it's going to be so it's good for you. Like, yeah. It's like in Lord of the Rings, Gollum seeing the light. Oh no, it's yeah. the light, you know, can't handle it. Yeah, it's too much. And, uh, and yeah, that, that, that travel uh, experiences that you've had, I had the same experience. Uh, for me, it was Russia. Mm. Russians and Americans are so much alike, no one has any idea. They look the same. You, you put them all in a room, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't be able to pick them out if you dressed them the same. Uh, but but the, the, the cultural influence on their thinking is so different. I loved being in Russia. And it was at one of their most torturous periods when the ruble, when inflation was crazy, the ruble crashed. And, you know, they, they're, they just depended on each other. And the, the, the kind of the friendliness they showed me, the, the love, I got invited in for tea by completely random strangers just walking down the street. They didn't even know I was American until later I'd opened my mouth and, oh, wow, he's not even from Russia, you know? It was just amazing. I was like, this could be in America, but we don't, we don't think that way. There's a protectionist idea, the fear of having everything taken away from you, the fear that you have to defend and protect what you own and you have to be better than everyone else. So the mindset's all about hoarding and fear-based thinking, you know, which is why when I came to New Zealand, I'm like, I like it here. I'm staying. It was just such a breath of fresh air from the world I just come out of, mm. you know, I, I, I couldn't do it. You know, your, your master chef uh, example, one of the most amazing scenes I've had, I think it was Hell's Kitchen. Mm -hmm. There was a scene where there was a guy who, you know, brilliant chef sitting there cooking away, uh, making some fantastic dishes, but he's just being berated, right? Just nah, 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 get a move on it. He ends up cutting off part of a finger. Okay. And because there's so much stress, he just keeps going. And the finger ends up in the frying pan with the rest of the food. He doesn't tell anybody until he gets caught and called out. It's like, you just cut off your finger, let it go into the food and just fried it up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what has to be happening in your head at that moment to be that different from your normal self? You know, that, that was amazing to see. Mm. And this is what, you know, I think this is what's weird for you and me, even though we can relate to it in our past, is those kind of pieces of evidence are available to anybody any given time, even if all you do is stay home and watch Netflix, you'll just see evidence of just how fucked up we are with our thinking, you know, or to put it more, you know, um, kind of technically how influenced we are by cognitive biases. And it's amazing again, how we look at everyone and go, Oh, look at everyone getting it wrong. And then we go to our own mind. We go, Oh no, that's correct. As if we're this alien amongst humans, you know? And I think, I think this talks ended up being a book review of anything, but people just, they got to read that book or just Google cognitive biases and start learning about them and just understand the freedom that comes from loosening your grip on your mind, on your thoughts from just going, eh, maybe that's not exactly what's going on. Maybe that's just a guess. Maybe that's not even fucking close to rational. Or maybe it's almost there, but it's been tainted by former experience or by expectations. And, you know, just kind of step back and go, you know, what? I'll just, uh, you know, in, in ACT therapy, they say, hold your beliefs lightly. And they often demonstrate by like holding a piece of paper with just two fingers like that, able to let go at any stage. It's kind of like if the belief works for you, you carry it along. And then something goes, no, this doesn't work in this situation. You just drop it. And it's, it's so much better. Like, I think the biggest one that ever occurred to me was around, I guess it would be around the word success. I used to always stress out about doing to a certain standard, you might say, and it was very hard to achieve that standard because I just moved the goalposts. Any given situation, I just decide it's this very high standard. 
And I used to always think like, oh God, it's so hard to achieve something and stand so high. And then I can't remember when it happened. I know I was working at Corrections at the time. I thought, God, this would be fucking easy if the standard was lower. And I was like, well, I can do that. Fuck it. It's now here. I was like, I can do that with anything. I can decide what winning is. Anytime I do anything, I get to decide what success is. I was like, huh, that's, that's way easier than trying to beat other people's standards. Like, I'll just make my own one. It's so much easier. Why haven't I been doing this the whole time? You know, like, oh, you've got to have a girlfriend. Mm, what if I just talk to someone? Let's just make it that. Huh, that, that. I can do that. And all of a sudden, I'm doing stuff, you know, instead of fucking stressing out. You know, I've got to be at the Olympics running. Uh, maybe I'll just run as far as I want to. Oh, I can do that. It was incredible. And I'm just like, huh, where did I get the idea that you have to beat some sort of thing? Like, why? It's, it's, it, all it's done is made me miserable. And even when I do win, it doesn't last. There's no sort of mark. Even if I'm in the Hall of Fame, nobody fucking gives a shit. Nobody visits the Hall of Fame to check you out. They don't care. I just saw Ricky Gervais doing something where he was hosting an awards ceremony. You know, he takes the piss when he does that. And he was like complaining how he's never won one. And he's like, don't worry. Nobody remembers these anyway. Enjoy your win for tonight because everyone's going to forget you tomorrow. I was like, well, that's true, actually. It's people busting their gut for an award so they can be remembered for about two minutes before the next award's given out, and then they just lost. So what was the point of that? You just busted your guts out for that. But this is what I'm talking about, is that fish and water thing. I thought I had to achieve stuff. Why? To what purpose? To what end? Where did I get that from? And I just dial back, and I see pressure from teachers to get good grades and I see like getting validation approval for getting an A plus and getting a rush from it and thinking that that's somehow a sign I've done a good thing. All these little pieces of evidence that I pulled together and actually none of them are evidence of anything. You know, there's certainly not evidence of a content and satisfying life. But then I sort of tried some new stuff. I was like, eh, change the rules. Let's, let's cook with different ingredients. Let's just fuck it. I'm going to make my own thing. I did that. I'm like, oh, that is so much better. My God, I, I, I've been missing out, you know. And I just didn't realize I could do that until people challenged me with cognitive bias information and stuff and said, actually, your brain makes stuff up and actually a lot of it's bullshit and uh, it sounds really real and it feels real, um, but it's still bullshit, you know. Mm. And it's not, it's not, there's nothing wrong with admitting to it. Going, yeah, I bullshit myself, mm. done it my whole life, will continue to do so for my whole life, just like you, just like him, just like everybody. So, you know. And it's, it's mm. essential to admit to it. It's essential to be aware of that. The moment you're aware of that, you're completely free, holding your beliefs lightly. I like, I like that, that idea. And everything that you have in your matrix, because like, yeah, but I know it's a matrix, so that's okay. That totally changes how I feel about it. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like accepting being in a prison and going, well, what can I do within the prison? Rather than like, I shouldn't be here. Or I'm not here at all. It's, yeah, it's, I hope people read the book uh, or yeah. the research. And I don't know, I think the, the main thing for me, the main lesson, especially from that particular book, was again, it was that, that one example of the guy putting a, himself through more pain because it ended slightly less painful and not realizing that he's hurt himself more. And I'm going, if a person can do that, it's undeniable. Nobody wants more pain. So if a person can do that, the brain cannot be trusted. It just can't. It doesn't record things properly. It doesn't report back on evidence accurately. Um, and that's all I need is just to know it's not that the brain's unhelpful. It's just not accurate. It's, mm. And that's all I need to know. And then every time I'm suffering, I go, okay, some, one of my inaccuracies has come into conflict here. It's put me in an impossible situation. And that's quite often what I think of it as. Is if I'm suffering, I'm probably trying to do something impossible. I've probably mm. got two beliefs that do not work together trying to happen at the same time. What are those beliefs? You know, like, like my client from today who says, like, I can't trust myself and I need to trust myself. They don't work very well together, those two beliefs. You can't have both. So one yeah. of them. 
and and one of the one of the brilliant realizations is that if if I'm suffering because of my thoughts, not because of something external, but just because of my thoughts, I'm holding on to them way too tightly. Mm. My thoughts should never cause me to suffer. They should give me information. They should perhaps help me look at possibilities, help me make decisions. I should never feel emotional suffering about my own thoughts. It makes no sense at all. It's not what they're for, right? Um, yeah, hey, one thing I wanted to, to add before we wrap this up is uh, we have a pretty good page on cognitive biases in the Brojo knowledge base, which is pretty good. I don't know if you've seen the Wikipedia page is pretty good, and I, I, I took a lot from there, and some other sources. But there is a thing called uh, the Wheel of Cognitive Biases. It's this giant uh, circular shape where it has like 250 cognitive biases groups. Have you seen that? Uh, the big wheel. Really interesting. Have a look at the. Uh, have a look at the. Yeah. It's really amazing because what I really like about it is the, is the groupings. It shows that it's not just, they've identified these, these little biases, but they've also understood uh, how they relate to each other, which explains a little bit about what our brain's trying to do. Mm. It's not doing it well, but it explains what it's trying to do. And that's, that's, that was really meaningful for me. Yeah, I'll probably, I'll, we'll get the link, we'll post it below. The video here so people can check that out and i think that's mm. that's the one thing that allowed me to reconcile cognitive biases for myself to allow me to sort of live with them and not fight against them but sort of not fall for it either was actually it was a ted talk where a guy was talking about how our our reality is basically an illusion inside our head it's our brain guessing at what's happening in that and whatever the real world is that nobody knows about and kind of painting a picture of it big 3d one and one of the things he talked about is like the concept of a snake now we don't actually know what a snake really is we know what we see and touch and hear and feel and we know when it bites us that we die but what he says is the possibility like that a snake is more like a, a computer code that's malware some snakes are and we just represent it as a snake because it allows us to pick out snakes if they all look like these long, slithery things. And so the brain, like a cognitive bias works like that. Let's say you get bitten by a snake and it was venomous and, and you get hurt and you recover. From there on out, anything long and slithery you're going to think is dangerous because your brain knows you don't have the time to assess every snake you see, let it bite you and figure out if that was dangerous or not. It needs to like reduce this risk. And so it goes, well, that thing was long and slithery. It bit me. I almost fucking died. Long slithery things, they're out. We're out. We're not, we're not, fuck it. Not worth it. There's no real gains in like sorting them out into different groups. Let's just go no snakes for life. And that's what a cognitive bias does. And it can actually be very helpful. But really, you're not going to suffer from a fear of snakes. You know, it's not going to do you too much harm. To think, you know, I'm going to stay away from fucking long slithery things. I mean, we should probably just leave that shit alone anyway. Let it live its life, you know. Um, but then that helpful tool will then go, oh, that girl rejected me. Stay away from all girls. Because that's all it knows how to do it. It just categorizes everything. Just batches everything. Something's dangerous. All things that look like that are dangerous. Now, it's got a job that it stops you from getting bitten by snakes. It stops you from getting hit by cars. It stops you from walking off cliffs, it puts all high buildings and cliffs into a category of don't walk off this, you know, even though there might be one that you could walk off because it's got a net at the bottom. It doesn't want to play games. It just wants to get, keep it simple. So it's very helpful, but then it just looks at everything like that. It just goes, okay, that printer doesn't work. All printers suck. Um, you know, that, that, that power bill was very high. Like I'm getting ripped off. It just, it keeps doing it. And you've got to know when to go, whoa, not this time. This isn't snakes. This is something else. Hold on. We need to get back in the kitchen and have another look at this thing. And that's how I always sort of keep it in mind and just understand that thing. It doesn't know how to turn itself off. It's got one job, simplify reality. And it's just working all the time, just categorizing, you know. Um, yeah. Interesting stuff, man. I think we'll wrap it up there. But um God, it's such a great book. I Sounds recommend good. read it. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, yeah. I love it. And um, and let's do this more often because, uh, yeah, a lot of us we talk about uh, we should share it kind of in its undigested form, show what's going on inside the kitchen as it happens. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that we talk about here doesn't make it into our final writing or videos later. But I think it's really valuable to see the processes that got us there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Alrighty, I'll stop Catch it there. Come back next time.